Okay, um, I'm moving on to a piece from an author named Guillaume Fay from his book Archaeofuturism, European Visions of the Post-Catastrophic Age, published by Arctos in 2010. And to introduce you to Fay, I'm going to read from the bio provided by Arctos because he probably approved it. Um, Guillaume Fay was born in 1949 and received a PhD in political science from the Institut d'Etudes Politiques de Paris. He was one of the principal organizers of the French New Right Organization Research and Study Group for European Civilization during the 1970s and 80s, and at the same time cultivated his career as a journalist, particularly in the news magazines Figaro and Paris Match. In 1986, he left GRECE after he came to disagree with the direction of the group, which he felt was becoming overly academic and less engaged with the actual problems confronting Europe. For more than a decade, he worked as a broadcaster for the French radio station Skyrock and on the program Telematine, from which aired on France 2 TV. He returned to the field of political philosophy in 1998 when a number of his new essays were collected and published in the volume Archaeofuturism, which has also been published in English by Arctos. Since then, he has produced a series of books which have challenged and reinvigorated readers throughout Europe and North America. His books have become must-reads for European rightists and identitarians, regardless of whether they agree or disagree with his ideas. Over the last decade, Fay has been no stranger to controversy, having published books on immigration, the clash of civilizations, and the question of the right's relationship to Islam and Zionism. He also published a monthly journal, I Understand Everything. He is very influential upon the identitarian movement and rejects the communitarian and pro-third world ideology propagated by his former GRECE colleagues. He is also a frequent contributor to Land and People, the Land and People Group, and still lectures and writes frequently. Arctos has also published his books, Why We Fight, which is a manifesto in the form of a dictionary for the identitarian revolutionaries of the West, and Convergence of Catastrophes, which is an overview of the many crises that Faye believes humanity will have to confront in the near future. The reason why I read all of that to you is because um, it's important to understand that that Faye is a leading thinker in the new movement that has sort of achieved an existence in the United States under the moniker of the alt-right. Um, but the alt-right in America seems to be a kind of faint shadow of the new right uh, in France and other European countries. What I mean by that is that even though the American alt-right is sometimes inspired by the European New Right, um, there are differences, differences in tone as well as in reasoning um, that can't be overlooked. So by reading a little bit of Fay, this may be your first introduction to what's come to be called New Right or Identitarian Thought that, for better or worse, has become pretty influential in Europe and is now making its way into the United States. And given all the changes that are afoot in our political scene, I think it kind of behooves us to um, learn how these people think um, and to better understand um, the core ideas uh, behind the movement that may not be always uh, perfectly understood even by the people involved on the ground in the movements. And that would be the case with Guillaume Fay's ideas. I picked this selection because I think that it, it did the best job of applying to the subject matter of the class. Like the left accelerationist that we just got done studying, um, he has his own critique of liberal capitalism or neoliberalism and also communism. And he has his own proposal for a different and better future. Like the left-wing accelerationists we just studied, he starts out on a fairly pessimistic or even catastrophic note. He says, people no longer believe that tomorrow will be better than today, just as today is better than yesterday. Thanks to technological and scientific advances and the alleged educational and moral improvement of humanity, as well as the spread of democracy. 
evidence is mounting that growth, this measurable mockery, does not actually lead to any objective increase in well-being. The decline of the secular eschatology inherited from Christian messianism is a hard blow for the egalitarian worldview, for it erodes the very philosophy of history on which the latter is based. Well, as I said before, there's a sentence for you. Eschatology in religious terms refers to the final goal or end of mankind and usually the second coming of Christ in the Christian religion. So Fay is employing a fairly common notion of secular eschatology or secular the secularization of religion. Underlying what he's saying is a notion of history in which as religious faith declined in the Western world, we substituted religion's power for the power of secular ideologies. And the secular ideology which came out of Christian messianism, you know, the idea of the second coming of Christ as the end of history, that got secularized into egalitarianism, individualism, a certain faith in human progress, and perfection, but he wants to say that we've proven that the idea of progress leading to some sort of perfect future is an illusion and a myth. So basically he's denouncing progress, the idea of inevitable and good progress as being a sort of secular religion. It's a myth and uh, the reality, he argues, is is that uh, it hasn't worked the way people expect it to. So then, in the section Historicism versus Progressivism, he says, the question we must ask then is, what can progressivism, with what can progressivism be replaced? Progressivism to him really is, when he uses that term, he's talking about the faith in progress, okay? So he says, the failure of liberal capitalism to attain its goals of equal justice and prosperity for all, and the collapse of the communist dream, which pursued the same objectives, have cleared the way for the establishment of a third path. So again, just as the excel left accelerationists um, denounced the uh, effects of both neoliberalism and communism, Fay does the same here. And in the same way, he's arguing the path has been cleared. If we open our eyes and look objectively at the results of both of those systems, he says there's more harm than good, and the failure of these two systems should establish a third way, or should call for a third way. He says what has now emerged is not a world unified and nourished by history, the linear and automatic outcome of progress, but rather a chaotic and multipolar one that is undergoing globalization. Um, he's hitting at the, uh, you know, the, the idea of the end of history put forth by Fukuyama. Again, he's saying that's wrong. What we really have is not an end of history, not global democracy and capitalism. That's not going to happen, or to the extent that it happens, it happens in a destructive way. What we really have is a multipolar world and one that is undergoing globalization. And he's referring there to globalization through markets and telecommunications, so both economic and cultural globalization, um, meaning that there is this ongoing consumption of other cultures. The way that Faye thinks is that um, part of the terrible legacy of neoliberalism is precisely that its success has begun to erase um, many cultural differences around the world and to try to bring everybody into the global economy and the Western way of thinking um, a lot of diversity is going to be wiped out. He rather relentlessly argues that societies that don't want that type of onslaught of globalization um, and that or are only partially touched or greatly untouched so far by it are better off without it.
He says, today the perverse effects of mass technology are starting to make themselves felt. New resistant viruses, the contamination of industrial, industrially produced food, shortage of land and a downturn in world agricultural production, rabid and widespread environmental degradation, the development of weapons of mass destruction in addition to the atomic bomb, etc., not to mention the fact that technology is entering its Baroque age, all great and essential in inventions had already been made by the late 1950s. Later enhancements constitute not so much concrete improvements as additional refinements of little use, like decorative touches added to a monument. In other words, at this point, and that's what the reference to the Baroque age means because it was so ornate and everything, at this point he's saying that um, technology is being used to produce redundantly things that aren't needed, um, creating the whole consumerist phenomenon where the economies are kept afloat by consumption of things that are mm, both maybe not necessary and also even harmful for people to indulge in. And then unlike the left accelerationists who basically call for a real ramped up uh, left-wing political ideological agenda, um, Faye argues that change will happen not through a political program and an argument, but will happen through catastrophe. He says, catastrophe itself, not the will of governments, will change, will bring change to the current economic system. And this is because technological science produces more problems than it solves, in his view. He says, in the global spread of technological science, each step forward implies one step back. So life expectancy is on the increase, but does this mean that people are living in greater harmony and with less anxieties? More and more methods of mass destruction, such as nuclear, bacteriological, and genetic bombs, are being developed. Agriculture is improving, but ultimately the return of famines is threatening an overcrowded humanity, which inflated thanks to the fall in mortality. We must now face problems such as soil erosion, the destruction of the tropical rainforest, the decrease in arable land, and the depletion of fishing resources. The increase in production and trade leads to new forms of cooperation, but also multiplies the causes of conflict and expressions of nationalistic chauvinism, and everywhere feeds the counterfire of religious fanaticism. Communication branching out across the world is, is branching out across the world while solitude plagues individuals and a sense of despair takes hold in communities. So in these sentences, he's, he's described many instances of where technological advance has backfired or has, has created as many, if not more, problems than it's solved. I thought the last two were particularly poignant. Um, he talks about... Um, religious fanaticism being partly or maybe in his view entirely caused by a reaction to globalization basically a reaction on the part of people in other parts of the world against the uh, the tendency to be swallowed up by a western capitalist neoliberal system and I might just mention here before I forget that unlike the um, the conservative uh, in America, the European um, New Right is not necessarily pro-capitalist. And I know that's hard to wrap your mind around, but um, Fay is very critical of capitalism. And several other um, New Right authors that I've read lately are likewise just as critical of capitalism as any socialist or you know, very left-leaning author would be, but for different reasons. They tend to talk about how capitalism is very destructive to cultural identity um, because it makes people shift and move around and and um, ignore their their traditions, their place, and all of that. So, so, so we call them far right or you know extreme conservative, but um, they. In America, we think conservatives support neoliberalism, right? And here we have people on the far right. In Europe, they, they definitely uh, don't. 
The other poignant point he makes has to do with um, increased communication branching out across the world. Um, you know, I think of uh, uh, the, the use of smartphones everywhere, even in the, in the poorest countries, people tend to have them now and they, they gain access to the internet. They get Facebook. Um, we, we know like the effect of Facebook and Twitter and all sorts of social media. Uh, people say they have the effect of, of increasing isolation and sort of a sense of anxiety, social anxiety and, and uh, all of that. They haven't necessarily been as good for, um, for people's mentality and their social connectedness as, as, as we would have thought when they first got started. As far as addressing the objection that we can't stop developing countries from pursuing industrialization because they're going to want to get in on the growth that the Western developed world has already gone through and it's not fair to them to stop them. He says, basically, we aren't going to have to stop them. Again, he talks back to a, some sort of catastrophe. I think he has in mind... Um, you know, global warming. I know I've, re I've read the entire book and I know that he takes global warming very seriously and he believes that it is leading to climate change that will, you know, drastically affect where, what kind, how much food can be grown, water supplies, and all of these things are going to press hard on humanity and, uh, and, and will force change. He then challenges the Western notion of wealth and somewhat, you might say, champions the pre-development um, people and the pre-development mentality. Um, he says, already in the 1960s, some Africans, such as Credo Mutwa in South Africa, argued that pre-colonial tribal societies, small, scattered, and demographically stable societies, were far more pleasant than contemporary African societies, which are complete failures based on a botched imitation and poor grafting of the European model, one totally alien to them. And on another page in the section, Traditional Economies Are Not Underdeveloped, he really goes off on this very idea of underdevelopment, that it is in some ways a racist idea. It uh, puts too much emphasis on the goodness of progress, the assumption that it's always better to have progress, and exactly what progress means, it's technological progress. He says, consider all the casualties of the industrial way of life who, for a mirage, have abandoned traditional societies with low demographic rates to join the overcrowded megalopolises of southern countries, real urban hells. Besides, the members of traditional societies where little money circulates are neither poorer nor less happy than New Yorkers or Parisians with all their modern conveniences. There's a little bit of Rousseau in Faye, I think. Um, and that's, that's not necessarily a criticism, but it's an unacknowledged debt, perhaps. I, um, there's, a, there's a tendency here to look at the pre-development society as happier, more stable, more healthy, um, and they may very well be, but they all seem to want to become developed. Um, but this may be because of the press of globalization upon them. And of course, they may want to develop in their own way and react uh, to the cultural impositions of globalization. So he moves into three elements he says will coexist in the new post-catastrophic world. One, globalization. Two, the end of statism. And three, the collapse of civilization worldwide. Now this is interesting because he's had a lot of negative things to say about globalization, but here he's saying that it is not going to be completely destroyed. What he says next helps, to, helps us to understand what he means by these. He says, people preserving a techno-scientific and industrial way of life, yet driven by values other than those we have today, will coexist with people who have or will have reverted to traditional societies. 
possibly based on magic, irrational religious, pastoral, and neo-archaic ones with low levels of energy use, pollution, and consumption. So what he's envisioning in archaeofuturism is a global system of sorts in which those who are living in much smaller uh, and fewer urban areas that are still highly technological will, will inhabit a world alongside the many more who have reverted to a more um, pastoral or archaic way of life. And from having read the rest of the book, I can say he doesn't envision this being a sort of Europe and then the rest of the world situation, although more of the highly technical, technological society would exist in the areas where it is most highly developed now. But even within Europe, there would be pockets of high-tech society um, surrounded by societies of peoples who are living very much more uh, low-tech. And really, this is simply because there's, in his view, there's only so much technology, technological development um, that can, can be sustained on the planet. He argues in the book that, that uh, this vision of a completely developed world along the lines of industrial and post-industrial development is just um, ecologically unsustainable and has a, will lead to this environmental catastrophe. Um, and in the wake of that catastrophe, we cannot go back. Uh, we cannot do that. We have to live with the new changes, the new climate changes, and so on. Um, and what he doesn't explain maybe as well is he seems to think that it's necess necessarily going to happen that people's mentality will change. This is the, the hang-up that I had in his vision or about his vision was that he, he seemed to think that in the wake of this catastrophe that people's mentality would change, their values would change, so that in the, um, the high-tech pockets, you might say, um, they would have a coexistence mentality. They wouldn't think in terms of oh, enslaving or abusing or, um, I don't know, preying upon people in low-tech societies, even though there would be a big difference between them over time in their education levels and in their ability to defend themselves and so on. Um, you would like to think that a huge global catastrophe would change, pe change people's values and make them see that um, certain mentalities are wrong or that, uh, you know, consumerism has to be a thing of the past, you know, that, that we will use technology only to actually do what is good for ourselves. But he doesn't, in the book, in my estimation, he doesn't quite um, tell us how that's going to happen. Um, that's not a huge criticism. Faye wrote a lot of other books. Uh, he may lay them out, lay out more of this in other works. He probably does. Also, um, you could say the same, you could make the same sort of criticism of a Rousseau or many other political philosophers who give us a vision for what an other um, future might look like and don't presume to fill in all the, the details that they, in all their intellectual honesty, don't know. Uh, the second item, end of statism, I just wanted to note, means that we'll go back to um, a situation closer to medieval times or in Renaissance times in Europe when city-states and small communities were rather independent of each other and there weren't these huge you know, nation states. Smaller, more homogenous communities with more of a sense of um, their identity uh, will, in his view, make it easier for people to cooperate with each other, um, will make it easier for them to have a real regard for each other and to uh, cooperate to sustain themselves in their local area.
in the high-tech pockets, there would still be trade going on. That's what he means by globalization continues. Um, in, in and among those, there will still be air transportation, for instance. There will still be telecommunications. There will be all sorts of ways they can still trade with each other. Um, but at the same time, there will no longer be this push towards making all of these um, peoples in different areas culturally similar consumers of only certain types of products or um, only certain types of entertainment and information. Now, even though they coexist, um, Faye keeps coming back to the argument that those living in more primitive conditions in many ways will be happier and that there's no way to argue that people living in more developed areas are actually somehow benefited unequally by that development. The one area where I can think there's not a really good answer um, to the idea of inequality of happiness would be in health care, perhaps, although I suppose one might argue that people living in um, more um, underdeveloped or undeveloped circumstances might be healthier by nature over time, but I don't know. That's I would think that would be an area of where people could question the um, the equality of happiness uh, part of this argument. A little bit later, he calls the uh, more archaic areas neo-traditional areas. And he says, in neo-traditional areas, linear progressivism will be replaced by a cyclical view of history, which would mean going back to a more... Um, an earlier notion of time, uh, time punctuated by things like seasons of the year, um, uh, times of day, uh, you know, religious festivals and things like that that come round every year, rather than the sort of linear notion of time uh, promoted by the developed West. And he says in the techno-scientific areas, this um, linear progressive notion of history will be replaced by, quote, an unpredictable and landscapist view of history, in parentheses, the spherical and Nietzschean view promoted by Lochi, which was previously referenced. Giorgio Lochi was a Italian journalist and writer and one of the founders of GRECE. I think that... Um, that Fave is, is uh, referring to the idea by Nietzsche of something like eternal return. I'm going to try to tease this out a little bit. So this, this different view of history that's not linear, progressive anymore, but rather landscapist, is a view of history as an ongoing adventure into the unknown, basically. He says, like an unpredictable succession of flatlands, mountains, and forests governed by no apparent rational order. So we return to a type of history in the developed areas, the pockets, techno-scientific pockets, that isn't as traditional as in the so-called neo-traditional areas or archaic areas, but is still more like a story, an unfolding story rather than it is than it's some sort of, as he put it at the beginning, eschatological vision of some sort of um, progress towards an end. This is partly how they will be free from utopian visions, right? If we stop thinking in terms of some sort of end of history, some ultimate conclusion to which we're all headed, and we start thinking of history as a story that's unfolding and that we're a part of, uh, then we will not have this utopianism that tends to lead people to do things that are destructive in the, in the name of that goal. He returns to the idea of globalization again. He's, um, he's saying that globalization will still exist in the sense of spreading of markets and companies across the world. I assume um, in and among the developed pockets, but universalization is, is rejected. No more um, imposing a particular cultural, ideological, or identity upon uh, people everywhere. No more expecting all people to develop. 
Now here's an important part of the vision here. He says, the new economic system will have freed itself from two considerable burdens. First, the substantial cutting down of pollution levels will reduce the huge number of external diseconomies. So the costs that are put off, in other words, um, when industry creates pollution and nobody, um, nobody pays initially, certainly not the industry, for having it cleaned up and then down the road somebody else has to deal with it. It costs somebody something, uh, either their health or their tax dollars or both. So I'll back up now. He says, firstly, the substantial cutting down of pollution levels will reduce the huge number of external diseconomies with all their costs and the burden of having to lend money to developing countries will also have been removed as the goal of developing these countries will have been abandoned altogether. Secondly, the expenses related to state welfare will drop as most of the massive social investments that are currently being made will disappear as they will have become superfluous given the return to a neo-medieval economic model based on solidarity and proximity. That's what I meant earlier by, you know, these, these smaller city states and, and towns will be more homogenous culturally, probably racially in his view. And so they will cooperate with each other, that neo-medieval economic model, uh, try to have as much self-sufficiency within the community as possible um, based on solidarity and proximity, local economy as much as possible. So he ends um, with a pretty hopeful statement uh, similar to the left accelerationist. Again, they ended their manifesto with a, a statement of hope. He says, it is precisely the progressive and egalitarian universalism of the gospels strengthened by Protestant ethics and the philosophy of the Enlightenment that has led to the global spread of technological science beyond all reasonable limits through unsustainable growth, an engine out of control, when it was instead necessary to restrict the use of technology to certain areas. That's his major point. And so, obviously, for critics of, of the uh, New Right position, there's a lot of worry that with the, um, with the bifurcation into small pockets of high civilization and many others um, where people have reverted back to more um, archaic living, that uh, although ideally people would leave each other alone, um, that in practice this might create a power inequality that uh, might be exposed. That being said, he does make no more assumptions about the change of mentality or human nature than many other political philosophers that I've studied over the years, both right and left, um, all the way from uh, communist thinkers to the most neoliberal thinkers. Um, so by saying that he may have not anticipated or addressed as much as maybe he should or we'd like the, uh, the prospects of abuse in the system, we're applying a criticism to him that should be leveled at probably three quarters of the political philosophers we study. Anyway, I'll talk to you next time. Bye.